Thank you all for joining us this evening. So I'm going to do the announcements. So at seven o'clock, we'll have Kiyamara and the Patagonia Steppe, bounded by the Andes to the west, Atlantic to the east, eighth largest desert in the world. So I just want to brief everybody on the Tunnel Tops tour, which I really enjoyed hearing the backstory, and it's an incredible story. And uh, Dick Turner, who's sitting on the bench right here, um, <laughs> gave us the tour, and he's planning on doing one in the fall as well. So, uh, and we had like 10 people, which was a good uh, amount because the wind and the, you could hear them and get close and it was very nice. And then we had uh, evidently the best blueberry muffins at the end, which was uh, one of the little <laughs> pop-ups there. So anyway, look, look forward to that. Uh, keep that in mind if you want to go in the fall. And then um, in August, we just secured it. And Northrop uh, evidently has a garden and landscape diagnostics business. And she does classes for merit. And uh, Heather, you found Anne. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about Anne? Yeah, I mean, she is just this wealth of knowledge about plant pathology. So it's like, how do diseases spread? The difference between abiotic and biotic diseases? you know, maybe management skills. Her work is just so interesting. And yeah, I mean, I think that we're all going to get a lot out of it because <laughs> there's always something mysterious going on with a plant or two or 10 in the garden. And and yeah, she's got all the answers. So I'm looking forward to it. We haven't quite pinned down the subject matter. I mean, obviously it's going to be about pest management or I guess she's an arborist as well. So that, that would be within the repertoire. So if you guys have any suggestions that you want to hear about, um, send in my direction and we'll consider that with when we get that all secured. So that sounds like it'd be an interesting and educational presentation. Yeah. It's Monday, August 21st. And then I don't have a lot of information on this one, but we're going to be partnering with the North American Rock Garden Society. They are bringing a botanist, rock garden person. Kiamara, are you on here? Maybe you can help me out. Okay. It's Jenny Wainwright Klein. She's the supervising horticulturist at the, I can't say it, it's German for the High Elevation Garden. It's an extension of the Munich Botanic Garden. She herself was born in Zimbabwe and raised there and then went to school at Kew. She's worked at Kew in the Alpine section, and that's who we're bringing over. From Germany, very highly esteemed person, and it's going to be in a special place, special time. So it's going to be Tuesday, the twenty fifth. And she's an alpine specialist. Not, I don't know what her rock garden skills are. They do go hand in hand often, but not exclusively. But she's uh, also is a specialist in the Drakensberg. But we're mm. having her talk about the actual alpine garden at Schwenzin is how it's vaguely pronounced in German. For at one o'clock, we will walk through the gardens and various people from the Lake Merritt Gardens clubs, because it's all volunteer clubs, will show off their gardens and introduce you, and then she'll have a presentation and then chatting. And this $3 for every two hours is no one ever, it's just $3 once. You just okay. enter, and if you say you're a volunteer, they won't charge you. Okay, of course, but... the city of Oakland could use, I mean, the, the Lakeside Garden <laughs> Center could use the money, but it's up to you. But certainly, you're not going to run off to the kiosk and give them another $3 after two hours. Okay, so um, you get an opportunity to walk through the gardens at uh, Lake Merritt, which I think is going to be exciting. We have the bonsai and the rock <laughs> garden section, and uh, what else Warrior. do they have there, Kimara? The Varea Garden, which somebody by the name of <laughs> Ann Nichols is doing, and the Palm Garden, the Palmarium is I gather has a lot of interesting palms. There's mm -hmm. a sensory garden, a Mediterranean garden, but the main ones are the Brea, the Bonsai, of course, the rock garden and the palm. palm <laughs> they should be, the Brea should be blooming at that time, I would assume, yes? They seem they are blooming all the time, if you ask me. Well, there you go. <laughs> good, good, okay. Question for you, it says Wednesday the 26th, Wednesday's actually the 27th. Right. It's supposed to be Tuesday, the 26th. There'll be more publicity coming out on that. So you can take BART or you can drive. There is a 17-minute uh, walk if you're going to walk from BART, FYI. Otherwise, drive in the parking's right in there. Is Mary here? Yes. Would you like to introduce uh, Kiyamara? 
Well, Kiyomara has been for CalHort a, a real treasure. Last year, we made an arrangement that she for her to be growing plants for us. So we sold those plants um, for the last year. And anytime we had a in-person meeting, um, she's well-traveled. She's been all over the place. She's reorganized the North American Rock Garden Society Western chapter. So we now have one and we're all very excited about it. Uh, and she was really the driving force for that. She um, maintains a very large collection of plants in the um, Lake Merritt, uh, behind the Lake Merritt Garden uh, in a growing area and is busy sharing those with gardens. And some of them turn up at Ace Hardware on Grand and on lots of other places. She's about the most productive person I know. <laughs> so. Um, Let's hear from Kiyomara. Uh, last year, Linda, at the end of November through mid-December, Linda Arricchio and myself joined a North American rock garden tour of Patagonia. And most people think of um, Patagonia as these glaciers and mountains, but the vast majority of Patagonia is steppe plant, steppe habitat. And that's what's mm. on the left. I went because I wanted to see Roslet violets, and that is a very improper term. It's uh, a subgenus Neoendinum violet. And in Chile, there are 60. In Argentina, there's 59. And those numbers are sort of flexible because they're, they're moving species around left and right. And Chile, they're very hard habitat to get to, whereas in Argentina, oh. a vast quantity of them are in the step and easily accessible. Before I went, I read this Scottish rock garden publication. It's called the Viola Subgenus Neoandine. And it's just an alphabetical listing of what at that time, and it's only been 10 years, <laughs> were the species based on uh, classic taxonomy. And on the left is a list of the violets we're going to see. And on the right, I start to try to put them into the subsections. And there are 11 sub uh, genera wow. of the neoendinum. And here they are. The very bottom one is known from only one species in one location in um, Argentina. And it's a relatively new one. If you look at this little table here, we'll skip through most of this. You can see that very little molecular work has been done. The only things that have had molecular work are the, the really big sections, the rosalits, the subandinums, and uh, I would have thought the sempervivums too, because, but it doesn't seem we have molecular work yet. Here are the sections, and here are the violets we're going to see. You can see that we only saw violets in four sections, and I have not educated myself well enough to know where they are. They do go all the way up to the north end, up into Bolivia and Peru. One of the reasons I chose to go on this trip is the person on the left is Marcela Ferreria. I invited her to join us so that she could you know, correct me when I'm wrong, but I don't think she's gonna be able to. But the newest species of violet as of January of this year, it was just published, is named after her. And when you do go through that monograph, her name comes up quite a bit. So I thought, oh, I, I want a guide that's gonna take me to violets. It also turns out that she's a professor of um, systematics, morphology, and the evolution of vascular plants. And these lineages are 30 million years old. I figured she's gonna be a great person to give me information and she knows how to find them, I'm going. To place yourself where we are, this is Patagonia. So this upper part here is considered pampas. So a little of Patagonia has pampas. This here is the only glacier part. So you can see the vast majority of Patagonia is steppe and then some desert here. This lower portion is Tierra del Fuego. It is geographically different. Interestingly, a lot of the flora of Patagonia is on the Maldivi, Isla de Maldives, otherwise known as the Falklands. And to place yourself 
in relation to the equator, we flew into Bariloche, which you can see here is far from the equator as Mount Shasta. And we went as far south in distance as Mount Whistler up in British Columbia. So we actually went closer. We started in Bariloche and we went further north to about the equivalent of Yosemite and went as far east to the equivalent of mid-Nevada, like the Ruby Mountains. This is part of the what they sent out to try to get you to sign up for their trip. And you can see that on day two, they have Viola Petria. This was actually our day one. And our first stop was at a housing development. And you're just like, oh, what a great tour. I'm going to a housing development. And the very first plant I photographed was this adenocolon, which is an aster. And it's a cosmopolitan weed. And it's in California, so that was pretty, pretty silly. But I was very excited about everything. And this is Viola Petria, and it's in the Viola section of Semper Vivum. And it had been known as Viola Cotyledon. And you look at those multiple heads, it's very characteristic of Cotyledon, but you cannot see the stigma. And supposedly, what the literature says, Marcela said, Without that sigma really exerted, it is not cotyledon. This is cotyledon. You can see its stigma here, and it's in the shape of a bird or a W. This is Petria without that. Petria is known from three locations. The other two are in a natural park that we'll see later. And these are all the plants where at that housing development site. I have thought everything was exciting. I've grown mutisias. Oh, there's a mutisia. I've grown the Montiopsis from chili flora seeds. So I thought this was great, but it turns out we kept seeing these over and over and over. The rest of the day, we're going to be spending looking at what's known as the Valdivian forest. And with the exception of this very rare area here, all of Valdivian forest is on the east side in Chile. But there is a very small portion that just fits into Argentina, and that's what we're going to visit. So the Valdivian forest is over here, and we're going to spend the morning, midday in the forest, and then take a ski lift. It stays light, you know, we're very far south in the winter, our winter there, summer. So it's going to be light, and we're going to explore this, um, go up a ski lift and then hike our way down. But it was so windy. This is a lake and it's just really choppy. We had to abandon the high elevation ski lift because it was closed due to wind. So we took a lower one. And this is the forest. And Valdivian forests are characterized by a bamboo understory. Just to, it's like going to Olympic National Park in Washington. Just a lot of understory growth. This park is called Parque Municipal Lao Lao. And I was assuming because this is this big park dedicated to this big forest, and it's, there's a UNESCO site that it abuts that's called Bosque de Arianas. And that, it's both in Chile, primarily in Chile, but some in Argentina. And they, they run it together and it's 2,168,956 hectares. And so I'm thinking that this little park and municipal Yao Yao is named for the trees, the Luma apiculata. In fact, it's named for a, a fungi. And each species of the Citraria is specific to a species of Nothophagus. So the Australian Nothophagus have their own Citraria. Nothophagus dombii, which grows along the water here, has its own. Nothophagus antarctica has its own. They're all edible and they're all considered a delicacy and they're very tasty. So a lot of us do grow Lumina apiculata. These are the other um, dominant trees in the Valdivian forest. A lot. Can you see all that Chuskaya behind it? It's just a lot. So both the UNESCO site and this little park only recently developed boardwalks. So 
it's a very popular spot and you can see the degradation of the root system. This tree is estimated to be 650 years old. And this is a classic understory. This moss here is showing desiccation. And the entire time we were in Argentina, we had no rain, which is very unusual. So this moss is, has started to release this moisture and it allows for all these ferns like any rainforest. But for me, what was interesting is all these epiphytic calciolarias. All of these are calciolarias, the same ones that we grow here, polyrhiza, and that was on the base of that tree as an epiphyte. And I've never actually thought to grow calciolarias epiphytically. The one on the upper right is a uh, Valdivian forest endemic. Tanella is in the trade. I'm sure a lot of you've grown Tanella. Also a lot of these orchids that are winter dormant. They're geophytic. They start to go dormant in January and February and they die down into a rhizome. And then one last batch just to really emphasize how many calciolarias there were there. Our next day, we're going back into the steppe. And again, you know, she brings us to these sites and she's amazing. She just knows where these plants are. And so on the right-hand side, it looks like we're in a vast expanse, but the reality is we're right abutted to the airport and these planes are flying over. And we're gonna see um, four species of violets. One of them is a typical herbaceous violet. We're also gonna see the family Calceraceae and a lot of Junelias. I've been growing Junelia micrantha for um, over 15 years, so I'm pretty excited. And that's our first stop. So that's Volcanica. It's in the Rosula section. And that's why using the term Roslet violets is inappropriate. It only refers to the stemless. And almost every species in the Roslet section is monocarpic. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Not all, there are some perennials in this section, but most are monocarpic and all are individual. They're not rhizominous. They don't um, offset at the base. So every one of these, even though they're side by side, are individual plants. They're fairly cryptic. I don't, you know, there's one there and one there. Also at this stop, I just, anemone multifidida. It's only our second day. I recognize it from home. It grows all across North America and it's in the California flora. This is, Linda and I both have this as tropiolum incisum, but I don't believe it is. The reason being that tropiolum incisum has gray foliage and strongly undulate margins. And I tried to um, just try to enlarge it so you could see that the margins on this particular plant are not. Otherwise, it's a festoon of tropiolums. It was gorgeous. It was, I mean, I was very excited by this. This is my first introduction to Calceraceae. And you can see it's got strongly exerted stamens. I thought it was great. It comes from a basal rosette. So this is bupus. And the reason to look at the bupus is because it's got a central you know, rosette that it, this was coming from, and then arms. And later we'll see another bupus that you can barely see the central rosette. But a unifying feature of the family is that central rosette. Acena, I, most of you probably have grown that in gardens as a uh, nice ground cover. It's a genus that's um, primarily in the Southern Hemisphere. There's a lot in New Zealand and Australia, but there are species in Northern Hemisphere. There's one in Hawaii and California has a Sina pinotifida, which isn't very attractive in my opinion. This plant is presently available through John Cheapers, the bulb company, very inexpensive. It's part of a section called Pomatifolia. And interesting to me was that Pomatifolia does not include the South African palmifrons. And this map shows the distribution of the five species in that section. We're going to see Adenophylla. And we're also going to see uh, N. 
Yeah, phyla. This is only in the far south and at high elevations. This one is also in the trade, Lanceanata. And there is a hybrid between Lanceanata and Anaphyla that is called Ion Hecker that's very sturdy. If you can get your hands on it through a bulb exchange, maybe you're a member of the Pacific Bulb Society, that is a great bulb to get. And I'll talk about growing a Denophyla from John Sheeper's when I have too many, oh, now would be a good time. This is all at that one site. And those beetles were just running around. This is Oreopolis glacialis, Rubiaceae. And Rubiaceaes include our Luculias and Gardenias. And the smell of this particular plant, while not overwhelming, was certainly strong. And it was it just lovely. I just really, it was warm enough, it was just, filling the air. It smells great though. This is Zephyranthes. If anybody grows the Zephyranthes here, the rain lilies, you look at that and it's coming out of this dry, gritty soil and it just doesn't make sense. Um, the history of the name was that it had been Abranthus and that made sense to me. Abranthus Mendocinus. Mendocino is one of the Argentinian provinces. In 2003, its name changed to Myostema. In 2018, its name was changed to Hippiasperum. <laughs> and in 2020, it became Zephyranthes. Uh, mm -hmm. Zephyranthes is a wind god, and that's about all I can make it work. Because otherwise, it just doesn't work as a rain lily. But as a wind lily, it works. Zephyrus is a Greek god of wind. This is a gas station stop. You know, went to go to the bathroom and whatnot. And just like we have pampas grass as a weed, they have the our native poppy. And this, I believe, is Linda's hand. So you can see the size. They were huge. They were beautiful. And you would think, you know, in this photo that you're somewhere in California. But the stop she took us to, so far you're going, God, what a great trip. You've gone to a housing development, the back of the airport. Now we're at this children's playground, but in the hills right here and then behind us are these Australcactus, and they're in these gritty soils, and they're a Patagonian endemic. This one is no longer its own species, it's Coxii subspecies, and a lot of people on our trip were there to see the Patagonian cactus, and this mm. is I was not, so I got entranced by Hypocaris. If you look here, you can see it's in the Chicory tribe. I thought the, you know, I thought that was a beautiful flower, but if you make it all yellow, you can actually say, yeah, that's my driveway weed. So we have Hypocaris radicata as a weed in California. I still really liked it. And that's what I looked at while they looked at cactus. Here's our stop for lunch. Um, they do not use shortening in their pastries. So I just wasn't really sure about that lunch. But between my legs are this exilus. It's in the trade as Combri. Uh, they're trying to make it be its own species, uh, Nahula Hula Piensis, which just happens to be where we were. And it's very, very similar to one called Compacta. And Bart told me that he did see Compacta recently on Etsy. And if you grow cumbri, which is around in the trade a lot right now, you'll know the habit of compacta and you'll go, I need compacta, not cumbri. On our plant list was Colomnia grandiflora, which is a California native. And this looks nothing like our big Colomnia grandiflora, which is bigger, like two, three times the size and cantaloupe colored. In fact, this was really biflora, and she mistyped. She was just giving us a comparison to something that the people from California would know. This is a, our first real Janelia stop. And there's Linda, and this is a field of purple. I don't know how that reads on people's laptops or phones or whatever, but it's just fields of purple. So Janelia is um, found throughout the Andes, in the Patagonia and the Falkland Islands, again, Isla Malvinas. Miss Salvia, 
this Nasavia genus actually runs the spine of the Andes, but starting up in um, Bolivia and all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. It's actually asteraceous. And at this stop, I'm, I don't know Mostela very well, so I don't really want to say anything. I kept hearing her say salvia, and I kept on looking for salvia. I'm smelling it. There's no salvia smell. Looking for square stems. It's asteraceae, and we're going to see, I think, 12 different species. I don't know if you guys know tetraglocan. It's uh, studied a lot for its uh, remedial soil abilities. Um, it, the genus grows all along South America, again from Bolivia, and it goes into the um, Atacama Desert. These are the same species. One is hair suit, one is not. This is Linda, we're trying to work together. Um, this is stop seven, and, and so I take a photo, and any photo after this is stop seven until she puts her fingers up again, and I take notes. And this is this Rumex field we're in. And I see this, and almost every adesmia we've seen up to this date is yellow. And you look in the guidebooks, and all the adesmias are yellow. So I'm excited because there's a stragglers. I like a stragglers. And the stragglers in Patagonia are purple. However, um, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't right then, these wind petals and the keel petals in a desmia combine to make this sort of oppressed, pointed shape. Whereas a stragglers, the wings are wing like. So that was uh, an adesmia, and I was pretty happy by it. This is Moenia, Mo Mohenia. I don't say it very well. Linda could correct me if she would like to. Moenia. And for some people, this is what they've come to find. This is in the cactus family, but it should not be grown like a cactus. It will be under snow. And as soon as it finishes setting fruit, or even before, it will start to go dormant and be under the snow. And once that snow starts to melt, it can take a lot of water. So if you want to grow it successfully here, you grow it as an alpine. And once it comes out of dormancy, you can water it heavily while it's actively growing. They'll find it at high altitudes throughout um, lower Patagonia. I took lots of pictures of yellow daisies because every day I was sending Bart text with all the plants we saw and I knew he liked um, yellow daisies. This next stop has a, it's called Corrine abutilon. And we have Corrine abutilon in the trade just as straight abutilon. And Annie's annuals was selling it as abutilon, not this one, but a different species, Vitifolia. And I would really like her to take uh, this one on instead. So this stop is just characterized by a matteral environment of shrubs and grassland. And this is where we see this little viola amongst those grasses. And this is in a section called Rhizoman and a dynam. And succinctly put, it's rhizomatous, much more strongly rhizomatous than other sections. And here you can see two little. Um, these are one individual, but they grow apart, you know, like any rhizomatous plant. And they don't form those strong trunks. And that is characteristic for my reading only, mind you, of this particular section. I haven't a clue what this was, but it, these were the types of plants that are common in lateral environments. And we have them. You know, we come down the eastern side of the Sierra and they're characterized by shrubs that are placed a few feet apart from each other. And so here we have this tetraglocan again, this genus. And as this one happens to have a lot of papers written about it on soil malaration. And she mentioned that this is a typical of what this shrub does in this type of environment. And Sure enough, I looked underneath 
and it was filled with rhyophytes. It had the beginnings of a soil crust environment. Um, there are a lot of little seedlings there. And then if you look behind it back here, you know, it's bare and there's no, no, no bryophytes there. There's no crust development there. And so tetraglocan is a stabilizing plant in this environment. Also at the base of that particular plant were a desmus and then um, this viola columnaris. And it's set for vivum again, like the cotyledon was. And cotyledon at one point was believed to have a really extensive range as columnaris did, but it was a little more disjunct. This is columnaris again. And unlike the cotyledon, which offsets at the base, this one just is rhizominous. I can't tell you whether or not that's one individual, but most likely that's really actually genetically only one plant. This one would be only three plants. This is Azarella. And this thing was probably two and a half feet tall by three and a half feet wide. And it's solid. It's, it's like a rock. And this is a structure of Azarella. And that plant could be, you know, a thousand years old. It was certainly at least five, six hundred years old. And if you don't know anything about these little bun plants, rock garden people love their bun plants. And so this is a cross section. And you can see, and if you grow buns, you you're always weeding them. They have a whole distinct environment. So you imagine one two and a half feet by three feet, and you have a little environment here. Down here, it says leaf litter embedded. And what you get is soil, con you get soil developing. And then plants grow on the, the top of the bun and they help keep the bun from rotting out by utilizing the decay inside. I think that it's a fascinating thing. We're back to the Mywenias. This is Patagonia and Pretty much everybody was looking at the at the Mulvanias. I was looking at Mulgaria tridens. It's Spurbaniaceae, just like the Janelia, but I couldn't see why it wasn't Janelia. Actually, I need to go back one second. The genus is from Peru, all the way down to uh, Tierra del Fuego. And I was asking Marcela, why is this not Janelia? And her explanation is that the floral tube inserts into the calyx and the angle is, um, I think, less pronounced. I, I truly cannot tell you. Our next stop was for Gamphocarpus. And I hope you guys can recognize this as Calceraceae. You know, you got these extruded stamens, you got the basil, that, and we just called it broccoli plant. Um, there are 60 species that belong to the Calceraceae and they're all in the Southern portion of South America. There's six genera. We're gonna see four of the six. Now I'm gonna go up and explore these rocks and the plant in between is another Mulgaria. And in this case, fortunately, it does not look like Janelia to me. And this is a Patagonian endemic. Its range is, um, just very limited to the central section of Patagonia at mid elevation. And up in the rocks, I had hoped to find a calanthoid fern. I did not. I found this Cystopterus apiformis, which is a synonym of Cystopterus fragilis fragilis and some astrocactus that I couldn't ID. This is a phaedra, and it had been fristulata. And I did put in this terrible picture because I didn't want a picture with people. This is a Phaedra chalensis, and this is about three feet tall, and it is in the background here somewhere. There are a few of them. And I could not see how these two plants could not be separate species. And here they are with pe people. Uh, this is a much better, better picture of the Bristolata. Linda took. And here's close up. And to me, you know, here the flowers are above the foliage. 
It can grow, it was not just small because it was growing on rock, it can grow on soil, which is a different location, but the same species. And this is a three foot tall one. And the flowers are all, you know, below the tip of the foliage and down to the base. So, but it's all Chalensis now. This is another uh, Patagonian uh, endemic genus in the Fabiaceae. It's a huge, it's a big bun. It's not a bun plant like the Azarella, but this is a big bun that we're looking at. And I hand pollinated it. And I have a video that I can't make work. So you'll just have to bear with it. There's two parts on the upper part here and then the lip. And when the stick went in, these two parts close and the lip raised to seal off the reproductive parts. And I thought that was very special. And in the rocks all around us were these condors flying. And the, um, this is the back of Marcela's digital camera. And this is the size of the condor. And we saw them throughout the trip, these huge birds. And we did see lots of wildlife. This is the only one I'm going to include. Yeah, we're in our bus and we all shout out, oh, look at the rabbits. They're huge. They're like jackrabbits. This body is two feet long. And this is the legs, kind of like a kangaroo. So they're just hopping across the fields. And it was a remarkable sight. But they're not rabbits, which are lagomorphs now. They're related to guinea pigs. And that's the only um, set of animals I'm going to show you. But that's one to that, yeah, that's worth going to find, you know, look at those, the way they hop. Day three, we're going to be going, we're leaving Barolochi, we're heading north. We're going to uh, San Martin de los Andes. We're going to be uh, driving along around this, uh, the LeMay River. There, we only saw three Bignoniaceae. There are only five species in all of Chile and Argentina, I gather. And this is uh, the first one that we're going to see. And I think most of you have grown a Cremacarpus. It's a very easy plant. The seed is very you know, readily available. It's a nice vine. If you have it, it's worth growing. This is uh, Asteraceous, another Muticia. It's the same one we saw the very first day. And then there was this. And I thought against that water it was so gorgeous. Turns out that this is, is actually now in 15% of the Patagonian flora. It's a uh, European cardus, most likely Thumeri. And they, you know, when I showed Marcela the photo to have her ID it, her response was, us seeing pampas grass. She was saddened that we had not uh, taken the opportunity to eradicate it. This is a small cactus, Mowaniopsis, in no re way related to the, that large um, Mowania that we saw earlier. It's a genus with 18 species. And the cactus people are going nuts, you know? They're just loving it. There's also this um, Janelia spatulata, which reminded me of Verbena de la Nina, which reminded me of Bart. So I took the photos and sent them to him. And here, look at this cryptic, cryptic, cryptic Viola volcanica. It's a fairly widespread species. We saw it um, in multiple provinces. And we have this, Linda and I have this as listed as Axalis compacta, but upon close examination, it's um, Combari, the Nauhalu piensis. And there's the Montiopsis that I love so much. This is available through chili flora and it grows very easily here. Takes water, takes it dry. This is a relatively new family. It's Shopfiechiae. And uh, our Jonah, this what we're looking at, used to be in the Santa Lacia. It only contains three genera. This one here, the Quincha Malian, used to have 21 until 2015. There are 21 species in this genus. 
and now it's all been reduced to telensis. So here, if you look, you can see that it's, it's spindly, but it's a relatively large shrub. To the left is the proteaceous that I'm sure all of you know, and Bothram. These are lunch stop, and all of this is in Bothram all along the hillside. And Anna, who is our logistics person, and Marcela kept on talking about how beautiful and red it's going to be here in fall. And I couldn't understand how the embothrium could do this, but it's actually Nothophagus. This is the exact same location of that previous shot in the fall. This is us walking along a road. And this, that's, this is the same road on the left in fall. The Nothophagus, there are the Domia is evergreen, but a lot are deciduous and have that great fall foliage. And so this is a tourist destination for fall color. This is Anna trying to get me to hurry up to look at the Nothophagus, Antarctica, and Pumla up there. But I'm stuck because this whole area to the right is filled with violets. Violet, 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 violet just endless. And it also had side by side the Adesmia and then to the right, the Astragalus Crookshankia. And you can see here how the wings go out versus the Adesmia with the upright. This is another Gamphocarpha. And while not quite as exciting as the broccoli plant that we saw earlier, it still has a nice basal rosette, the um, strongly exerted stamens. And then just lots of violets were there. And our very last stop for the day was in the Nothophagus forest, looking, this is more rainforest. For us, there it's a little Spartan for the thought of rainforest, but um, it has enough water to qualify. And the understory actually did qualify, just Spartan trees. And we're, so we're way down, let's see if I can see, here we are, San Martin dos Los Andes, and we're going to go as far north and uh, west as we're going to go on this trip. And this is our drive, we're heading towards that volcano, and we did not see much this day. We did see um, the Skyxanthus, which is a southern South American genus. And you can buy this at, like even at Home Depot. So therefore I photographed it because that's what I was doing. All these rocks, I would, this is our lunch stop. I'm pretty excited. Um, this is the Lume River and it's world-class whitewater rafting fishing. And those rocks reminded me of a rock on the right-hand side I collected in the Kingston range a long time ago. And I was gonna take the rock on the left-hand side home and combine them. But it turns out that it's encrusted with something called rock snot, which is a diatom. And it's a major problem because it's uh, clogging up the river. And as I say, here's the river, white water rafting and the fishing. And this is a gas station. And I have a museum background. And the idea that a gas station had a diorama complete with non-liquid resin um, yerba mata just blew me away. These are the fishing, a whole pheasant head. And then this is our hotel and there's a hotel and this is a deck. These are the Nothophagus dombii. Again, you see them right under the water's edge. They just need a lot of water. And right below that balcony is this. And it was formerly Calanthes glauca. It has been removed and put into the genus Hemi. I say Hemiotis, but there's missing an and, and so I was trying to explain to Marcela what the difference was. And one of them is Calanthes has scales. And you can see here, there's no scales, but you can also see all of those ready to shed their spores. And I, I knew by morning that I'd have a teaspoon of viable spore in a piece of paper. And 
I asked the owner and I asked Marcela and I did fold it up and bring that home. And I actually have a few true ponds now. So we wake up and we're going up to, um, it's a ski resort and it's on indigenous land. And it's one of the remaining, um, I don't wanna say tribes because I'm sure that's cultural and sensitive, but they're actually um, have, still have a, a intact hunter-gatherer tradition. This is the view. This is the lake where we had just been and we're raising in our altitude. More uh, Calcia Larry, of course, more Rhoda Fiala. This is Garbaria sespitosa, it's Patagonian endemic. And then this one here is Mucronata, it's dioecious. And the berries come in both red and white and they're edible and they all taste good. Arenaria, um, I'm not sure, did we talk about it? With just the one that, it, that they're all now homogenies in California? I guess we did. So then here we have the Gamma Carpa again. So Arenaria only has the two species left in California. The rest being in the genus Armageny. And it's a genus that is very popular with rock garden. And this is Gamma carpa alpina with tacoid leaves. And this is Oreopolis. And that's the plant we saw at the very first stop. It's the same species, but here they're much smaller max and they don't have the smell that was down at lower elevation. There's a few. Um, Orchids popping in. And this is a Berberus microphylla. And this is a plant that's considered in the town that you're going to fly in for the, um, if you want to go see the glaciers, is El Calafate. This is a symbol of Patagonia. You can go to grocery stores and buy Calafate jam. There's dyes, the red dye from the bark is Calafate red. It's a very important uh, plant, culturally speaking, in Patagonia. This is where we're at. We are going to be walking up to here. And if any of you walked to Barcroft Station, this is what, in the White Mountains, this reminded me very much of the hike up to Barcroft Station. And while that looks really desolate, it's just packed with plants. These are the oxalis. It's still a denophyla. We're so far north, and the elevation's just not there for the other species. This is um, Viola codlidi. And you can see it's little, there's a little raised bump there in the center. There's multiple heads. They're semi rhizominous and offsetting at the base. And this is the Nasalvia. And you saw the seedling at the beginning of the, you know, showing your plants off. This is all Revoluta. We're also going to see Legacy, which is a much higher elevation species and is in the far south of Patagonia. We're um, in the northern end of Patagonia. And while we're at a high elevation, it's not as extreme as Legacy takes. Argentia is another alpine Nasalvia, but it's at the lower elevation and the northern extreme. So this is the one that I would have thought would have been the easiest for us to grow here. However, it was Nasalvia revoluta that chili flora had seeds of. So that's why I bought this one. This is another Asina. This is like a two foot mat and those um, Asina are a few inches long. I know a lot of people like Senecios, so I took a lot of photos of this Senecio papagee because I thought it was really pretty. This is an apiaceous plant. It's called Pozoa. Um, Pozoa this one's Pozoa volcanica. There are only two species of Pozoics, they're both Patagonian endemics. And this is Pozoa coriachia. 
sorry for those of you who can actually read Latin and go, oh my God, she butchered that. So um, it's very apiaceous looking, but then you start to get closer. And I don't know if you guys can see here. I mean, one, there's this sticky resin going on and one stamen and one stamen coming out of this blob. Apiaceous, but I don't under, I don't know this this um thrive. I did not investigate it enough. A very interesting plant there. Here we have the Kinchamalian again. And you can see where below it was that sort of up to two foot woody shrub. Here it's completely herbaceous. Um, the leaves are red. I asked Marcela if you were to take this to lower elevation, since it's still the Quinchimalian Solense, is it going to grow to be a woody shrub? And she said, no, it will stay herbaceous and the foliage stays red. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I was told. So some of us are sitting here for lunch and the rest of us are going to walk across here and up to the top. And at our lunch stop is our Maria Meridima. And you know, we're familiar with it. It's a typical garden plant, but in the Northern hemisphere, it's found in coastal areas. It's circumpolar and grows along our Northern coast. In Patagonia, it's a high elevation plant. These, um, Linda, I did this lichen is nephroma, and this to the right is one of the largest patches of grimia I've ever seen. And grimias are really easy to tell. They can only grow on rocks, and they are, have that black hue with the silver um, sheen. I don't know what this plant is. The gray behind it is last year's growth, I believe. I really don't know. I thought it was pretty. This is a Patagonian endemic. It's very small. I really hope that a place like Reitman's will get it into the trade. Would love to grow it. Chili flora did not have seeds. Here we have the Gonfotera. Pocarpa alpina again with the top red leaf and the uh, exerted stamens. All of you will know Elsa by the end of the evening. Callista Command Diamond was there. And as we go up, I had thought that we would be losing the viola cotyledon at some point, but it went the entire to the very top. This is our first encounter with Bernardium Major, and we never saw it in flower. So I uh, took this um, the Scottish rock garden cover so you could see the flower. It's in the Ranunculaceae. It's a Patagonian endemic. And when we went out to the eastern step to essentially Pahrumpa Nevada, there was one there, and we'll see it later. This is Senecio kingii. And if you look at this, you can see, yeah, this is purple foliage, beautiful purple foliage. I'd like to see this in the trade also. It's herbaceous. This is me standing in Chile, looking to Argentina. And the weather station is the, uh, the border between Chile and Argentina. The rest of the group was down in the Araucaria forest. And I was really interested about this bryophyte. You can see that it only grows at the base of the older Araucarias. And I was wondering if it's analogous to our species of bryophyte, Brylatonia vancouverius, who inhabits the same lower portion of um, bay trees. I did not find an answer to that. And I did ask recently and still got no answer. This is just close ups of the bark of these mature Araucarias. I think, I don't know how many people know this plant. It has been in the trade. It's a Patagonian endemic. The genus itself is South American, but this species is Patagonian and it's rhizominous, as you can tell. And in here is the Ostroblechnum that also 
a lot of us grow in our gardens right now. There was a pretty orchid in this Arcara forest. And this, this is the Gunra Magellanica. And then there's Rubus. And this is just this sort of solitary mat forming thing with huge flowers and then a single berry. And I thought that would be nice to have in the trade. This is a Patagonian endemic moss. And it was just so unusual. It's not like anything I'd seen in California. So I took this photo and I you know, had it feed out recently. I did not collect it. Our next is we are going to go for um, this Viola Cronifera. And this is the environment we're in. And all these little white spots all through here, as I keep mentioning, really, this is Caledrinia affinis. And the habitat of all of this is um, this sort of sandy grassland. We, we're getting out of that map, you know, the, where the shrubs are spread into more grassland now. We're getting drier. And Papostypha is what it species is the same as ours. Here it is on the cow floor with the distribution. And you can see these are primarily dry spots in California. But that's the environment we're in. I was interested. I'm assuming on a really good rain year, it would be like California right now where the waters are raging and this would get scoured out. It was the only place on the entire trip that there was any chance of throwing a boomerang. And I did, and that was great. Everywhere else was like where we just saw the calendrinia or like this, all of this purple here is all oxalis. So there's just no no opportunity to to not step on plants if throwing a boomerang. This is um, Azarella montantha, and from the last Azarella we looked at, we suddenly can see that this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. So you certainly don't want to just go jumping and cramping around. Here's a very young one, and for anybody who's ever grown Bolax gumnifera. This should seem really familiar because um, the Azarella was misnamed and put in the trade as uh, Bolac gumifera, which is another species in Patagonia. But they don't look, they look different enough that I was confused. This is a very large, very large Azarella. This is Berberus and Petrifolia, and it's in a subgenus of Australis. And what typifies this Patagonian subgenus are these really simple leaves that, as they dry out and age, they become spines. <laughs> you know, it's a desert type of adaptation. Leafy spines. There it is again. It's found only in Argentina and um, Chile. It's a Patagonian endemic. This is where we actually saw that ephedra that I showed you earlier to show you that it does grow on soil. And so you get the idea we're in a really dry environment. And here's the Janelia, but this yellow, this yellow is Calciolaria polyrhiza. And we've seen it earlier as an epiphyte. And so I'm suddenly, you know, I've never thought to grow Calciolaria in this sandy, gritty, the poprit soil. This can be this particular genelia can come about two feet tall. This is Lucaria and the Asteraceae, and the tribe is uh, Muticia. And it's a it's only in you know, southern the southern half of South America as a genus, and it does go to the Falkland Islands. I had thought that they looked similar to Hypocaris. But as I say, this is the Maticia tribe. This Calendrinia is in the trade. It's uh, sold by Reitmans on occasion. I prepare to pursue it. It does okay here. So Olsinium, we have the Glossii, and this one looks really similar. And so I included it for that reason. But later, we're going to see um, one that doesn't look anything like it. 
And this genus in the southern hemisphere is in Bolivia, all the way to the tip of um, Patagonia. And this is the plant we've come to see. Well, at least it's a plant I came to see, the Cornifera. It's very distinct. And it's never been um, in any other species, but with it is growing the Pachysoma. So here on the right, Pachysoma is very columnar. Uh, Cornifera is nearly, it has a stem, but nearly stemless. It also is um, rhizomatous. So here you have the Cornifera. When it's in flower, it's very easy to tell them apart. But when it's not in flower, here's Conifera. We can tell it's Conifera, Coronifera. But this one here is Pachysoma. And you can see how tall it is. Most people were looking at the Muhenia. This one is Darwinii. And this one is Patagonica. Those are the only two species. And they were both at this site. And this is the lowest elevation they're going to get is my understanding. And here's another um, Calciolaria polyrhiza. In this case, it's growing in a crack of a rock. So every time I've grown it here, I've grown it in a much moister, much less drained situation. And suddenly now I'm seeing it as an epiphyte and as a crevice garden plant. So this is a photo that Linda sent off to Marcela, and she identified it as a Montiopsis, perhaps just a flora, which is a Patagonian endemic. And it's usually, but not always pink. So if, if it is truly that, it's, she told us we're pretty lucky to see it and we should feel lucky. So we did, at least I did. This is a stragglus again with an adesmia. So you can keep looking at the structures of wings to keels. And this is a photo that Linda took that I thought is just very charming, so I included it. And here we are with our stop number five, the Junelia. And you can see it's really dry where it's, it's like we're down in the New York mountains or um, someplace like that. That's a, it's not that dry, but you know, you're somewhere out of Bishop. There's another lunch. This time it has a hard boiled egg. No shortening in the pastries. And there is an azarella. And growing in the azarella is viola dazophila. And you can kind of see that, you know, all the matting, you know, it used to be in codledon, viola codledon, but it lacks the bump in the middle. And I don't know if you notice in that chart at the very beginning, very few have molecular data. So these are all old fashioned visual taxonomy going on. And this is all it, I just, I just loved it growing in the azarella. And so you can just imagine it's, it's using all the decay and preventing, you know, removing moisture and keeping the interior of the azarella dry. This is also where we saw the other Bernardia. So I had been thinking Bernardia just from reading these rock garden journals were these high Arctic uh, snow melt type plants. But in fact, here we are down at the, just outside of Bishop. Azarel on the left, the viola. This here is Jabarosa and it's endemic to the province we're in, which is Nuaukin, solanaceous. And it has this big white, morning glory flower and it's white and beige pink against that orange foliage. This is Tazara. It actually goes all the way up into Mexico. And if uh, Kristen Yanker Hansen was here, she would could tell us if it's in the trade. I just don't know. And this is me trying to figure out if I'm looking at Nasalvia axillaris or glomerosa. And axillaris has these leaves along the stem here. And glomerosa supposedly has leaves only here. So I named this um, axillaris, even though I had written glomulosa. I would take any species I give to Nasalvio with a grain of salt. 
This is a video that I took stills of to show you the wind and the beauty of this um, formerly Stipa, now Java. And along here with all these other things is Viola tectorum, Tectophora. And I'm not sure if you remember, the Roslet has both perennials and the monocarpa. And this would be, um, you know, I took it from that monograph saying, oh, it's an annual life form. And the leaves clearly have uh, narrower lamina than the uh, volcanica. I just found the fact that they were serrated margins was enough for me. Again, it says that it's annual to short-lived perennial, but it's just monocarpic. This is a Zephyranthes again, but now we're at a much drier, lower elevation and much further east. This is um, a genus that only has two species. They're in the genus endemic to central eastern Patagonia. It does go into Chile, barely. And the one on the left is the showy. And the one on the right is uh, not so showy. I took this photo of the Plantago Patagonia because I actually didn't know what it was, but I recognized it as something from California. And you can see in the little California map and the USD map how ubiquitous it actually is. Here, this is baby, really young, um, Nasalvia glomerosa. More Nasalvia. Oh, now we have Axillaris. And that's Mendocina. And we can be sure of this genus because Marcela stood there and pointed out and it's much rarer than the other Nasavias we were seeing. This is Janelia, and I call it the Janelia stop because these we saw at this one stop these five Janelias, and on the right is all the Janelias we saw on the trip. And these are the Janelias at this stop. This is my Krampa, and I have been growing it for 15 years. And even though it's similar to an Azarella, it looks like a bun. It's pretty tough. It's got a rock on it. It's rooting all along the base there, unlike the azarella that's a true bun. And so you can just cut your azarella micrantha up, I mean, your junelia micrantha up into little itty bitty pieces and pot it up and you'll continue to have it. And I grow it in the ground successfully here. But the one I really want now is Patagonica. So if you look at this one, it's real great foliage and it's just real tight to the ground and grows over things and makes those lumps. And it's got a silver sheen. And that silver sheen is because the leaves grow into this oppressed, I guess that's a little column, pointed column. And every leaf here, these are leaves that are pressed into this, this shape. And each leaf at the end has a hyaline on that gives it that silver cast. I thought it was spectacular. And then another Janelia that's pretty interesting with the yellow stems against the purple flowers. Senecio, because everybody seemingly likes Senecio but me. Now we're to the Terra Cactus and we're still in Noitin province. And that was the Terra Cactus. Now we're to Aracana. They're all, its protuberances are smoother. You can see that this is much smoother than the last one. I would have had a hard time calling this a tarot cactus, but the cactus people in the group assured me that's what it was. So one of the things, there were shrubs in the Solanaceous that um, reminded me of Erica's, and this is one of them. And when we were there, there it's, you know, Anna keeps saying, what family? What family do you think it is? And I did not get to Solanaceous. And it was hard, but uh, that's what it is. And there were two of those shrubs. The second time, I wasn't caught. I got Solanin. This is Muticia again. And it's a much shrubbier form. We're now to Viola Petria again. We're at that uh, national park that I mentioned. We saw this at the that housing development. And you can see how you, it was at one point considered Codlutin. 
but it has been pulled out and made into its own species. And I believe that it's based on some molecular work. It was done in 2018. This is a aster, and you can see the Lucaria here. So they're both in the Muticia tribe. It's a genus that's in South America, southern, southern half. And this is it in flower. I just I thought it was pretty nice. Here's our second genus of Bignoniaceae. This you can see this person here. This is on a really steep slope, but it's also in a, a horse field across the street on completely flat ground. And Bart's been growing a lot of bignonia, so I took a lot of photos for him. And across the street was also this Menzelia. And we have Menzelia, Loaceae in California, Blazing Star. We also have really small ones like this. So here is another rosulet, violet, true rosulet. It's subandina. It is also monocarpic. You can see just how cryptic these uh, roslets are. And if you look here, what's really interesting is there are seed heads that are completely ripe and ready to be picked. And I didn't pick them. Marcela uh, impressed upon us that Argentina really frowns on seed collection. And I did not want to uh, ruin that trust. So even those who were completely there, I didn't take them. This is the Oxalis compacta that I keep talking about, that if you're going to get one, Bart says he saw it recently on Etsy, this would be the one I'd get. This is um, our hotel where we end up that night. And right at this lake where these animals are is Viola uh, Pachysoma. And Pachysoma, I include Martin Sheeter's name here, He's the author on that. He's also a member of the Alpine Garden Society, Scottish Rock Garden Society. And he's pulled this out of Columna Eris into its own species, Pachysoma. This is the stop. This is our bus. We're going up the road and this is our first stop. And we're stopping here because this is where it's easily seen and very well documented, a naturally occurring hybrid between the Pachysoma which had previously been Colinaris and the Cotyledon. So here's the parent Cotyledon. Here's the parent Pachysoma. And here is a hybrid. And I only can tell you they're hybrids because I was told they were hybrids. This here, I meant to delete this slide, but that is Polysticum and Dynum. This is Cotyledon. And at this point, you know, we're guessing. So all of us are going, ooh, Cotyledon versus, ooh, Colinaris. I'm relatively certain that is a Cotyledon, just as I was readily certain that this was a hybrid. This, though, because we, you know, it is documented, this is a hybrid. On the left is a hybrid, on the right is Pachysoma. These are both cotyledons, and that is the hybrid again. Here's the Polistic Mandina and the Senecio Papagee again. This is a rehab center. This is a hotel, and the A-frame is rental cabins. And this is a set of hot springs. And we're going up above the hot springs. This is Azarella lycopoides, and this is a fen environment. And we're just going to the top of the fen. This has got to be a huge, really old uh, Azarella lycopoides. And in the fen is the Calsa, Calpa Sagittata that goes all the way down to um, Tierra del Fuego. It's found in Bolivia. It's found at Lake Titicaca at 4,000 meters. Here are two uh, Patagonian endemics, the Nasalvia digitata, Valerian macariza. Valerian is found on all continents, but this potato species is endemic to uh, high alt the altitudes of Patagonia. This Draba, if you know Drabas from California, they're no bigger than um, quarters at best. This is larger than a basketball. 
It's primarily found in Chile, but there are occasional ones in Argentina, and this is very rare to see in Argentina. This is a, a um, calendrinia, the cultigane that goes all the way from Bolivia down to Terra de Fuego. And this is where we're going to be walking up to here. And we're seeing, here's this alcyon, and you can see how different they is from the previous gentia or the deglossii. This is our lunch stop, and you can see all these little pink things. And this is where it's called, now we're calling it rhodolirium, but it's still rhodophyella, rhodolirium. At this point, there are synonymous names and the taxonomy is still being dealt with. At this stop is the polystichum and dynam on the left and the astroblechnum microphyllum on the right. And you can see the blechnum has that typical rhizomnus growing. Linda has this as viola petria, but it's not. Petria does not go this high. It's down below. And this is um, cotyledon. Here's the uh, viola cotyledon with the alcyonum cotyledon. And you should look at these because right at this moment, these are all cotyledons and pachysomas. This is Nasalvia revoluta. Pistagma. This is an Iphion relative. And we'll, most of them do look like Iphions, but this one was really unique looking. Moschoptis is another genus of the Calceraceae. And since I didn't see it in flower, we can't see that it's going to have those exerted stamens. But you can't see the basal rosettes. And it was a really interesting leaf. It's got a lot of turquoise in it. This is a Patagonian endemic Senecio. Um, it's classic with all the hairs on it. We're still with the cotyledon and the, but suddenly we have these. And these, um, Martin Sheeter, who named Pachysoma, is suggesting this is its own species of Papahuensis, which is the name of the volcano where we're at. And I spent the entire time with these violas where other people went exploring. And I'll just try to go through these pretty fast. I just really, really like them. Whether or not they're their own species, I don't know. And if Marcela isn't confident to say yet. There's no molecular work done yet. And so while I was hanging out with those violets, everybody else explored around here and then came down to here. So I came from the right and met them for lunch at this point. Unfortunately, Linda took these photos. Uh, Valerian, um, another species of Patagonian endemic. This is a Ridgeron leptopedalus. It's most likely going to be lumped with a Rigeron Patagonicus. And here you have your Gamma Carpa again with the topoid leaves. Arnari again. Anarthophyllum, another one, different species, higher elevation, Patagonian endemic. And you can see here that the when pollinated, the flowers have changed color. Here's our um, first sighting of Nasalvia legacy, and now we're headed down. And these dark blobs here are plants that, due to the, you know, their structure, are melting the snow. So Calendrinia is on the left, and on the right is this Calca, and their old foliage dies into this black, um, hard shielding, and the, it absorbs the heat and causes the snow to melt. And the flowers have formed underneath. So the minute the snow's gone, the flowers emerge immediately. And here, the snow's gone, probably a week, and it's in full flower and leafing out. This is Beloa. It's a native range. It includes Venezuela all the way down the Andes. This is India, and it is a Patagonian endemic. Here's another Olsinium. This is Crosacoma. And it's a Patagonian endemic. And a lot of people went and saw a waterfall. I was too busy trying to um, transcribe my notes for the day with all the violets. And 
I thought the Araucarias up there were really cool and the basalt formations. And Linda, Linda had the energy to go do this. We are now going to head to our furthest east section and we go through this really fast. This is Cho Small. This is essentially Pahrump, Nevada. And we're following the river down. It's as if we're leaving Yosemite and going down Tioga Pass. Here's the other Solanaceous plant that reminded me of the Erica. This is Chukwairaga. It goes into the Atacama Desert. There's a species, Chukwairaga atacamas. I think Linda and Barb saw it. This is another Bubina. It's Aracana. And uh, north of Columbia, it, this has just recently been removed from the Verbena genus because anything south of Columbia is diploid. Anything north of Columbia is polyploid and still Verbena. Solinomatelis, we saw three species of this. And I did not take this photo, but it is lovely. It's a Patagonian endemic with 14 species. We saw three of the species. We're coming down Tioga going into Bishop. On the right is um, Cystopris fragilis, and on the left is Oryza microphylla. The species is endemic to Patagonia. The genus is South American. It's a very popular plant with the rock garden group. And here we are. So pretend this is uh, the Owens Valley, the White Mountains, and we're just coming down the last part. And here's the the you know what we're seeing we're seeing the rhea which is equivalent to our creosote uh, creosote is the rhea tridentata we're seeing an acroplex we're seeing the equivalent of mesquite so it's a very familiar flora in that sense we're seeing the stipos this is a walking stick in the grass by now, I'm sure you recognize the uh, Calceraceae, and there's a the flower. And you have to ask yourself, this really long tube, you know, and the ovaries is down there. Just a very interesting um, flower stuff that you're in. Now the Nasalvia, Pinellia, I could have deleted those. There's the Budlia, and that was pretty much, um, we had this in the trade. It doesn't do well locally. But here it is in habitat. And this is the last Calceraceae. Here is Chistagma. And here it's looking a lot like the Iphion. Senecio chalensis. This could easily be brought into trade. I was hoping this was Astragalus nivicola. It might not be, it might be. Flamingos, we saw flamingos. So you just think of it as at the flamingos, there's a little water course, and we saw this Hypsella, which is Lobelia uglifia, grows very easily here. Calcer, this is the genus for what the family's named for. Another bufus, but you can see, you can't even see the basal rosette on this bufus. And there's our last bignonia, very small one, just 12 inches across. These are the violets that we went looking for and didn't see. And then we went to the glaciers and just, I would have said my trip was over, but Linda said, no, keep going. So this is the, one of the few glaciers in the world that's still growing. Linda has a video of this amazing calving right there. It was noisy, it was amazing. These are the plants we were seeing. Escalonia, a shrub in like your average condominium landscape. I thought this was a great rust fungus. It's endemic to Patagonia and grows on Berberus. And this is the hike that Linda and I are taking. And we have to stop here. Our guide is not a flower guy, but he's gonna assess the safety of proceeding at that location. And what we've seen, I don't know what this plant is because he wasn't a flower guy, but we saw Crimea Magellanica. And this is our stop. Now we have to walk across this grass and into these trees. And this is where we're at. And he's he's a, uh, decided that Linda and I are capable of walking. And it's very windy. And these are the flowers we're seeing. 
the Saxifrage Magellanica. Here's our high elevation Oxalis anaphyla. It's an um, endemic to the very south of Patagonia at high elevation. And interesting to me was it's also in the Falkland Islands in the grassland. This is Lucaria. It's another endemic, of course, and it's um, only at the highest of elevation. And their highest elevation is here only 7,000 feet. Something that reminded me of a Dudlea, Moroxalis. And there it is, Armeria meridima at this high elevation. And this is Linda and I sitting here. And I actually got permission from our guide to go down to the edge of the glacier. And I got just over the edge and it was so windy, I couldn't stand. And this is our very last stop. And there's a fen stop. And this is a Patagonian species, but the genus is um, on every continent. And I was entranced by these rosettes and I didn't even notice right behind it is a lycopode, big fields of lycopodes, I was told, never noticed them. The Alstromeria, Patagonia, Musavia, and this is Calciolaria uniflora. And it, um, it's only in the southern part of Patagonia down to Tierra del Fuego. And a lot of these flowers don't have that white stripe. And I was wondering why don't does it have a white stripe? It's because birds about the size of a dove called a leaf seed snipe come and eat the white stripe off and then their head brushes against the reproductive parts. And so their head, here's the anthers with the pollen and here's the stigma. And it goes from flower to flower, pollinating the flowers. And these are Marcela's books that if you're interested, I can tell you how to order. The book for the mountains that I would really recommend is out of print and it's Martin Cheaters. And this is the viola that uh, Marcela sent the photo of, we only saw it on, uh, completely trampled by cattle. It was sort of sad. And that's my end. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah. All I, that's all I can say is wow, wow, wow. I kept saying. Great photos. Yeah. Just um, spectacular. Just terrific, terrific. So someone's asking, what was the name of the trip? This was the North American Rock Garden Society Patagonia trip. That's the name. And they they offer a few trips every year. And you should just go on their website and get your name on it. So you have to get your name on the trips. How fun. Uh, it just sounds like a wonderful, wonderful trip. Oh, it was, I mean, I had a great time. <laughs> I didn't think I would enjoy it much, but I did. I I learned a lot. It was too much all at once in in some regards. You know, Linda and this lady Maureen were really helpful and Bart in the sense that every night, like I would sit there and I would text Bart and Linda and Maureen and they would then give commentary so that we knew it was like having a daily journal. Well, and so I could go back and Linda would say, oh, you missed this. And Linda would then send photos in because it was one of those group texts. Well, those are some of the most unusual plants I've ever seen. Just amazing. Of those violets, you know, I mean, I've only read about yeah. them and then to have seen, and now I know even more and how many more there are. And so that's what Marcela has invited us to go um, explore, to go look for violets with her. Mm. Are we able to grow those um, at this elevation? Um, I have grown in the very first part of the talk. There is actually a picture of one that I grew and flowered. Um, I grew and flowered it of all places, Merritt College. And when <laughs> it finally flowered, I, it had been there for years doing nothing. It just wasn't dying. And I started screaming and Stu Winchester was there. And like people are running out going, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I'm like, showing them my little Rosalind Violet in flower. And I have another batch going right now. I'm going to try again because after that, I gave them all the way. It was too stressful. <laughs> <laughs> and where, where will you be selling those or are you, will you be? Oh my God, I, I heard, 
but the last batch I gave away to to people I thought would do a better job than me. I mean, I'd rather no offense. I don't want to sell them. I want them got to it, live. It. I want to be able to point to them 10 years from now and go, I grew that. I gave it up, mind you. It's like, you know, adoption. Well, <laughs> give it to somebody better grower than me. But I do understand that you are going to be selling plants at the September NARGS meeting yeah, that Mary, we're hosting. the same plant you grow every Tuesday. Okay. I wanted to ask, what are you selling? Yes, great. Well, we'll sell that and we'll see, you know, I mean, other people like Troy, myself, you know, Linda, we all have our private collection we'll probably add to. Great. So you're talking That's about the really September great. meeting that we're invited to? Awesome. Yes. I'm going to take the day off. So do you have to grow those um, violas in the sun to, in order for yes. them? Yes, you have to grow them. You know, if you look at them, not one of them is in the shade. They're all... Um, at, it's not that it's such a high elevation, but southern, such a southern um, latitude, that they have a much higher UV than we do. Mm. Ah. So, so that's why my nasalvias are really elongated. I did not photograph the violas that I have grown because you know there may be a centimeter of frost after you know four months. Mm. But I have a dozen violas going, I'd say. Fun, fun. They're all from Chili Flora. Anybody can order the seed. It's Chili mm -hmm. Flora. Kim Mara, this is Judy Wong here. When we went to Chile a few years ago, we were going to meet up with the Watsons. Are they still around? Or are they Because they were specializing in the roseate violets. Oh, I don't know. I didn't read anything they'd written, therefore. And I didn't meet <laughs> them because I was in Argentina. Ah, okay. Well, What's I, the name of it, Judy? I, assume, I actually assume they are, um, and I think you are pretty lucky. They're they're in that monograph. Yeah, like it's uh, John beginning. John Watson and his wife um, is yeah. Anita. Yeah, they're the, they're the ones that wrote that monograph. Right. But I just are the I didn't I I didn't actually meet them, and I haven't read anything that they've written recently. So in all honesty, I don't know. Okay, thanks. But that monograph is great. Yes. Nice. Well, especially there's so many of them. That's and they. Oh my god. They don't all look like the same, but you know they are very quite similar uh, species. Oh. I would think. Yeah, Ellen, amazing. I think we only saw one roseate violet when well, we were there. Well, they're much harder to see in Chile, and that's why going to Argentina, if oh. that's what you're looking for, is a better place to go. Because the, a lot of them are in the step as opposed to ah, the other ah. And if you saw that last part where Linda and I were hiking up and we had this guide and he kept assessing whether we could keep going. And mm -hmm. it was because of the wind. And when I tried to go lower, I was blown over. Yeah. Huh. So yeah. if you're trying to find violets in that environment, it's much harder. Go down to the step, it's still windy. But if you fall over, you're not on a rock. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right ben was asking how much does a trip like that cost you roughly? know i was so surprised it was i mean i i'm not poor i know i'm not poor but i'm poor and therefore i was thinking it was going to be really expensive and my husband's like you know you really want to do it take it whatever i mean linda would know better than me but it's a few thousand dollars for the plane fare and then it was roughly seven thousand for me with airfare and the trip and all of that. And how long were you there? Three weeks. Oh, that's wow. reasonable. And that included, you know, the internal so all kinds of things. So wow. all the food, the airline, and that was my total cost at the end. And so I came away thinking that I got a really, you know, for me it was a lot of money to just uh put into a tour that I wasn't <laughs> sure I was going to like, but it was definitely worth every cent. Great. You Great. liked it. I hope yeah. Marcella, <laughs> I don't see her here, but if she's here, she was wonderful. She's just very knowledgeable. She knows how to find plants and she knows where they are. And you would never know. She's just so easygoing. And, and I mean, I would, I did not look, I, all kinds of things I didn't do ahead of time. And one of them was research 
my guide's uh, education. <laughs> and to know that she's, I mean, she's a major contri scientific contributor to the Patagonia oh, flora wonderful. and the yeah. evolution and you know, all kinds of things. So That's exciting. And she could talk to anybody at any level. So there were people that were very knowledgeable. She could talk on their level. And then there were people that were novices, like on the salvia, like, is this a lamb, the Asia? And, and, and communicate beautifully with anybody. Nice, nice. nice. Thank you, Kiyamara. That was just amazing. I just want to go on your next trip. Thank you. The Narg trips, they're relatively... They subsidize the trips a bit is one part. Um, so most, I, I, I'm on the board of NARGs now, sheerly by accident due to BART. And I've learned a lot. And most organizations' trips make a much larger profit on their trips than NARGs chooses to take. I see. So their trips for what they are, are relatively ex inexpensive. And they use people that are in the rock gardening community, such as Marcela, to be their guides. And she's not a professional tour company, but she's got it down. Knows her stuff, and that makes it easy. Yeah, and Narcs provided this guy, David White, and Anna for doing the logistics for her, as opposed to being a formal tour company. Okie doke. Next month, we'll have Ann Northrup I'm talking about something that will be educational and interesting. Thank you, everybody.